Today we're going to start chapter two, talking about pressure. I need to return to something that I talked about earlier. When we defined density, we defined it as um, a mass per unit volume. That's not quite right. I need to be more specific about that. And let's look at, for example, an estuary. This is where a river meets an ocean, and you have fresh water, which is lower density, flowing into salt water, which is higher density. As that mixes, you have the salt water that tends to stay towards the bottom of the estuary, and the fresh water, which is lighter, and tends to run across the top. Now, if we want to look at densities at different locations in that estuary, we may pick two points, and we would expect the row in the in the fresh water to be at a lower density than the density in the in the salt water. Um, but under our previous definition, rho is just mass per unit volume. So the question is really, what kind of a volume are we talking about? The density changes continuously from one point to another. So if we really look at any kind of discrete volume, we're not going to get a very accurate reading of what the density is. So in reality, um, we need to talk about density in terms of points. And a better definition is that it's the differential change in mass over some differential volume as you take the limit of that volume going to zero. So this is really more of a differential statement. And it's a more ac accurate way of defining density. This, this is, in fact, how density is defined in the FE handbook and in your textbook. Um, pressure is the same way. I'm sure you're aware that pressure is a force per unit area. But again, the question is what kind of area are we talking about? Pressure can vary continuously in a fluid. So we need to talk about, again, a, a differential area as that area approaches the limit of zero. So my point here is that density and pressure are both continuously varying scalar fields. So within a fluid, they will vary continuous, they may vary continuously in different locations of the fluid. Um, so they are field properties. The differential equation describing how pressure varies in fluids is dp dz equals minus gamma. So in all gamma in all fluids, the dent the pressure varies with elevation as a function of its specific weight. And then in the x and y direction, in the horizontal direction, there is no change in pressure. And this is an important point which, which we will make use of. If you're at the same elevation in a fluid, the pressure will be constant. A couple other details we need to think about. Pressure is independent of direction, so it is a scalar property. It's not a vector. But when it interacts with an object, then it does take on direction and that direction is defined by the object. It always acts perpendicular to the object's surface. Now that was pressure in fluids. Fluids includes both liquids and gases. If we focus exclusively on liquids and liquids at rest, we can describe how pressure varies in those situations. So if we take a pool, for example, and we want to measure the pressure at a certain depth in that pool, we can do that by integrating the equation up ahead, up at the top of the page. And the um, because gamma is constant in a liquid, this is the incompressible assumption which we've talked about, if gamma is constant, that's a simple differential equation to integrate, and the result is there. Pressure equals minus gamma z plus p naught. Okay, so the pressure at some depth and we've defined the z direction as being zero at the surface and pointing upward, which is why there's a negative sign there in the final equation. So the pressure increases with um, depth. And in addition, if there is any pressure pushing on that water surface, then that gets added on to the pressure as well. Um, this solution implies that we're talking about absolute pressure. <clears throat> Another way of looking at this, and I'll often use this equation because I think it's a little easier or a little more obvious, the pressure is gamma h. It's gamma times the depth of the fluid above it. And this implies that we're talking about a gauge pressure. So again, 
you look at this figure along that line a b um, pressure is constant so pressure is constant at the same elevation regardless of what the shape of the object is above it this is also true for fl flowing liquids with a free surface and let's look at this these two objects here on the left we have a conical vessel on the right a rectangular vessel let's say the rectangular vessel holds twice as much water so it weighs twice as much what would the pressure be at the bottom of the two containers and if the H is the same then the pressures have to be at the same so again the shape of the object that contains the liquid does not matter what's most important or what's only important is the elevation that you're at or the depth of the water that you're at. Um, this is for resting fluids but it's important to remember this also works for fluids in motion if you have a free surface. So here's a picture of um, water in a river or flowing through a channel where there's a, a surface open to the atmosphere. Whatever depth you're at in that, in that open channel flow will tell you what pressure you're at as well. <clears throat> okay, let's do an example. Let's say we have a container that's filled with water and um, with water and air and the air pocket has a gauge pressure reading of 7 psi. That's connected to a tube that's open to the atmosphere. And the question is um, how high will the water rise in that tube? Okay, so we can, and we're going to solve this using gauge pressure. We can, whenever you have these types of problems, you have to make a choice whether you, you're going to use gauge or absolute pressure. Since we don't know what the atmospheric pressure is, and we're given a gauge pressure reading, I'm just going to go with gauge pressure. I'm going to pick two points, A and B, and the pressure at A is equal to, we can calculate using the equations we just derived, and you can look at the height of the water column above it plus the pressure pushing down on that water surface. Numerically, that can be calculated with this equation. Um, gamma of water you can look up. There's two, foot, two feet of water above it. And then we have seven PSI as well. We have to convert the square inches to square foot. That gives us the pressure at point A. Then our next relationship that we use is we know that the pressure at A and B have to be equal because they're at the same elevation. They're in different shaped objects, but again, that doesn't matter. Remember, pressure is always the same as long as you stay on the same elevation and are in the same fluid. Then we can again use our equation, gamma H, to figure out what the pressure is at B. Um, I don't have P naught in there because it's open to the atmosphere, and P naught under gauge pressure is zero and we can solve for H to solve the problem. Okay, pressure has all kinds of crazy units. One unit which is um, kind of unusual is head, and I want to talk about it just for a moment. When you get your blood pressure taken, a good blood pressure reading is 120 over 80. That is in units of millimeters of mercury. So, so how can that be? If, if pressure is a force per unit area, why in the world would it be reported in units of length? And it's because they're using what's called head. And you can rearrange the pressure term in terms of height the fluid will rise. So if we take our equation, P equals gamma H, and flip it around, we can now refer to pressure in terms of that height. And that's what's done when they take your, um, your blood pressure reading. The original machine that was used to do this had a cuff that you pressurized and that was connected to a tube filled with mercury. So as you pressurize the cuff around your arm, as that pressure increased, it lifted the mercury column higher and higher. And however high you could lift it, that was the pressure reading. Um, we can convert that to a PSI but, and report it that way, but the convention is to use this units of head or millimeters of mercury. So, for example, it's really easy to convert from one unit to another. Um, if you have 14.7 psi, um, what is the head of that unit or of that measurement? Or, in other words, how many feet of water can you lift up 
could be lifted up by that pressure. So again, we just use H equals P over gamma. Our P is 14.7 PSI. Always be careful with PSI. Square inches will cause you tons of problems if you don't notice it. So you've got to convert square inches to square feet. And that gives us 14.7 PSI is 33.9 feet of water. Um, this, is an, this is useful for another reason. 14.7 uh, PSI is atmospheric pressure. And that can lift water 33.9 feet. The maximum vacuum you could ever achieve is negative 14.7 PSI, right? That would be a perfect vacuum. So this, this represents the maximum height you can lift water with a pump. So if you have a pump above ground trying to pump water out of a well, the maximum you'd be able to suck that water is 33.9 feet off the, uh, a depth of 33.9 feet. Um, to get, to push water up any higher, you'd actually have to physically move the pump down into the bottom of the well.